Good evening and welcome to tonight's Book Passage author event. My name is Allison Bainbridge and it is a thrill for me to be here as the host. Uh, this is an event that I believe will provide you with crucial information about a topic that is inevitable for women, but one that was not discussed until very recently, menopause, and another topic that has been discussed since the beginning of time, but perhaps not in this upfront detailed manner, phalluses. I'm sure these remarkable authors will make the discussion of topics engaging and entertaining, um, just as she did in her groundbreaking bestseller, The Vagina Bible, Dr. Jen Gunter, the internet's most fearless advocate for women's health, brings empowerment through knowledge in her new book, The Menopause Manifesto, by countering stubborn myths and misunderstandings about menopause with hard facts, real science, fascinating historical perspective, and expert advice. Frank and funny, Dr. Jen debunks misogynistic attitudes and challenges the over mystification of menopause to reveal everything you really need to know about perimenopause, hot flashes, sleep disruption, etc., cetera. Um, and much more. And as a 60 year old woman, I can tell you that I wish this book existed about 15 years ago. I would have loved it. <laughs> Emily Willingham's fallacy is a wry look at what the astonishing world of animal penises can tell us about how we use our own. <laughs> the fallacy sold to many of us is that the penis signals dominance and power, but this wry and penetrating book reveals that in fact nature did not shape the penis or the human attached to it to have the upper hand. <laughs> fallacy looks closely at some of nature's more remarkable examples of penises and the many lessons to learn from them in tracing how we ended up positioning our nondescript penis as a pulsing, awe-inspiring shaft of all masculinity and human dominance. Fallacy also shows what we can do to put that penis back where it belongs. Emphasizing our human capacities for impulse control, fallacy ultimately challenges the toxic message that the penis makes the man and the man can't control himself with instructive illustrations of unusual genitalia and tales of animal mating rituals that will make you particularly happy you are not a bed bug. Fallacy shows where humans fit on the continuum from fun to fatal phalli and why the human penis is an implement for intimacy and not intimidation. Dr. Gunter is an internationally best-selling author, obstetrician, and gynecologist with more than three decades of experience as a vulvar and vaginal diseases expert. Her New York Times and USA Today best-selling book, The Vagina Bible, has been translated into 19 languages. The Guardian calls her the world's most famous and outspoken gynecologist. She's a columnist for the New York Times and the star of Gensplaining, a CBC video series that highlights the impact of medical misinformation in misinformation on women. Dr. Gunter also appears in the Netflix series, A User's Guide to Cheating Death, and her TED Talk reached 1 million views in its first month. Emily Willingham is the author of Fallacy, Life Lessons from the Animal Penis and the Tailored Brain from Ketamine to Keto to Companionship, A User's Guide to Feeling Better and Thinking Smarter publishing in 2021, and is a regular contributor to Scientific American. She lives in the San Francisco Bay Area, as does Dr. Gunter, where she completed her postdoctoral work and hails from Texas, where she earned a BA in English and a PhD in Biological Sciences. So please enjoy our event. Now to you. Thank you. Thanks so much for the introductions. Thank you um, so much. It's great to be here with you, Emily, I have to say. Yeah, it's fun to meet again <laughs> to talk yeah. about all things private parts, I guess, right? Exactly. So I have a question for you. <laughs> I have so many questions for you, but you know, I think, so I'm, I am trained as an endocrinologist, and when I read the Menopause Manifesto, I found things that surprised me, even so, and so, and also very interested in learning about them, given I'm a woman of a certain age, and I was wondering what you found as you wrote the book that was surprising to you. Oh, well, I, um, I was unaware of um, of actually the origin of the word menopause. I, you know, I had that always wondered because I was, I was wondering about that. So I was like, well, did they really think periods were going to restart like menopause? Like, did they, were they that? Old? Yeah. And, um, and I also, um, I think I was surprised at, um, at how many really cool words 
women had to describe their symptoms that were kind of taken away by the medical literature, you know. Um, and uh, my favorite one is called hot blooms, which is a term for dark blushes. And as someone who's had them, I can tell you, they feel like they are blooming out of your head. So it's a more faithful description. And actually one of the old textbooks I have from 1850, the, the guy who wrote it, Dr. Edward Tilt said, you know, we call them hot flushes, but you know, women call them hot blooms and that actually more faithfully represents the experience. So I'm like, well, wait a minute, if that was more faithful, why, why are you using the other term? <laughs> Which, you know, is a good question. So first of all, I agree about the bloom because it starts here, right? And it just kind of, you start, you feel it set in, it just goes woo like that. And you're like, okay. So I like bloom. <laughs> yeah. I think we should change yeah. it to hot blooms because one, that's a term that women came up with. And two, sure. it really does feel like it's coming out your head. Like, a bloom. <laughs> and it's really funny in the office, I'll tell women that I'll say, you know, it used to be called hot blooms and everyone will go, Oh yeah. Like it really right. sits well with people. It's like somebody turns up the dimmer in there, right? And it just goes woo like yeah. that while you know inside of you. So or then they right. slip and you're like, oh <laughs> <laughs> right. turn that damn thing down. So right. I, so out, like totally not related to the fact that we were talking tonight, <laughs> but somebody asked me a crazy question about the penis on Instagram today. Oh, okay. And so I, I wanted to start asking you about the, the crazy question on, on Instagram. I bet you've heard it before. Um, <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> well, I bet you have. So I was recently told about an evolutionary theory of how or why the man's penis is shaped the way it is. To work as a plunger to remove possibly previously deposited sperm of a competitor. Hmm. Thoughts? Speaking of language, Right. I mean, there's so much, so much packing of language into that. Right. And the implications of it. So, I mean, first of all, you know how this works physiologically. Like if you, you know, if a, a person deposits sperm in a vagina, it doesn't like lie there <laughs> and wait around, right. For the plunger to come along. Right. Yeah. They're just like, and they're out of there. Right. So, I mean, it doesn't make a lot of sense just on that basis alone. Um, I actually write about that in my book a little bit because there's a lot of, I think the, speaking of language, language about women that 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 scientific researchers have used, let us say, of a certain demographic, um, that characterize us as as they're, they're sneaking, there's hiding, and there's you know a cult, <laughs> which in terms of both just like hidden and witchcraft, and then there's this whole thing about but even in spite of all of these wiles and wicked ways that we have, we leak by accident in various places and in various ways, we leak ovulatory cues and all this other stuff. And so I was starting to think, wow, we actually sound like we're plumbing. And then you get to that part where they're plunging you, right? Because presumably back in the day, you had paramours lined up outside the cave entrance, I don't know, and you would just roll over and you know get it on with the next one and they would we need to plunge you. We all have male harem. <laughs> all the time right well wouldn't that be interesting anyway and so i mean it's the idea is that there's sperm competition going on and that the penis is plunging out the previous partner's sperm but i mean just physiologically that doesn't even make any sense so yeah well i figured i figured it didn't um <laughs> but it, and it's funny that you said plumbing right because that's actually how the ancient greeks really thought about women so they thought we were basically walking defective like versions of men and we had leaky plumbing we had leaky pipes you know mm -hmm. and Every, every bit of our fluid cells were overstuffed with fluid and we couldn't manage our fluid. And so that's why we had to menstruate. Um, oh, and that was a fun fact I, I learned that, that the ancient Greeks thought that when you were pregnant, that the blood backed up into your breasts. That's why the breasts got bigger. I know. And, and I was thinking about it, you know, when I was reading through it and it, and it, was, it was very revolutionary, like in the 1500s, 1600s, to think of it as blood. I'm like, did nobody ever like look at it? Because how could you think it's anything else? How could you, <laughs> I like you? They would have seen slaughtered animals and did they not have cows? <laughs> they did. I mean, yeah. so I she really, I've kind of become obsessed with that idea that they didn't think it was blood. But how could you think? It, like, what would you like? Even if you think women are defective plumbing, like mm -hmm. you're really gonna retrofit that and say it's like just water or like, I mean, 
it's clots. <laughs> it's clots. <laughs> so I, that's what I wanted to. I would love to know how. I mean, obviously, it would never be written down, but how they explained that away is not like. Now, I mean, obviously, if you know nothing about pregnancy and everything, you understand. But that that piece yeah. fascinates me. So. All, all of that stuff from the old literature, right, is so fascinating in the way people try to explain phenomena, I think. Yeah. So is there something about penises from like the old literature that you're like, oh my God, that is just like so crazy? You know, there is, there's a, I think it's 16th century by a man whose last name is spelled Cockburn, but I think it's actually pronounced Coburn. But when you're doing, when you're writing about penises, the names of the researchers, just, they're all like that. You're like, oh my gosh, seriously? It just keeps going and going. But, um, this fellow wrote a, a treatise on the gonorrheas, as he called them. And he actually, women were leaking. There was a lot of leaking going on. And women were the seat of gonorrhea. And the, if there was leaking, that was a bad, like leukorrhea and things like that, that was per perceived as, you know, that was somehow unwanted and a manifestation of something terrible. He's also very confused about um, the anatomy. Like he got a lot of stuff conflated. He put there was a urethra in the wrong place and things like that. And they just didn't they just didn't know <laughs> or bother to look more likely, actually, I think is kind of more the point based on what I discovered. So, yeah. 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 Well, it's interesting about gonorrhea. So as someone who's cared for a lot of people with gonorrhea, men and women, it's far more obvious when men have it. They really it's really very obvious. In fact, it's very mm -hmm. somatic and women. So less, much less so, especially if you, you know they didn't have speculums and stuff in those days. Right? Right. So, yeah. um, but I don't think I would, you know, when you look at, you know, you know, the, the ancient Greeks didn't really do, you know, they didn't use cadavers and um, Galen didn't actually much either. I mean, they did a little bit, but I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I don't think they really actually started to like cut things open and actually really look until like the Renaissance. Like, I think, yeah, I think otherwise it was accidental, right? Yeah, so I think that's how they made their discoveries was kind of accidentally. There were a lot of laws around, right, cutting people up and what you're allowed to do anyway. So, well, this is a <laughs> uplifting <laughs> part of the discussion. <laughs> He's read a lot of like ancient medical stuff. So yeah. I, I was talking with a hepatologist, a liver specialist about this. Mm -hmm. And you know the myth about Prometheus and, you know, uh, stealing the fire and so being condemned to having his liver eaten out every day and then it growing back. So mm -hmm. it actually regenerates. It really does. So um, so I'm just wondering, like, did, did the ancient Greeks, like, like, what are the odds that they picked the liver? Right. Like for yeah. Them, so did they they must like like what are the odds? They could have picked anything and they picked the liver. Right. And I have I think they they knew something because I mean, first of all, they called it the liver, which you know <laughs> is the thing that's living, right? And so they I think they had some they must have had some idea about it. I remember reading something about the liver and just and and I know that um, like Cleopatra and Mark Antony, when they were, you know, on their last legs and knew they were, they called themselves the inveterate livers, which was supposed to be just kind of a joke. So they knew things that happened to the liver and they knew things the liver could either recover from or not and the regenerative properties. I think they must have had some kind of idea about that. So, um, but I'm, I'm wondering, and I can tell where some of it's come from because clearly it started millennia ago, <laughs> but, I know that one of what well, can you tell me first of all what motivated you to write this book, especially after the Vagina Bible, and you know what kind of what are the worst examples of misinformation that you found? I know there's so many. <laughs> I'm trying to pick which one of my children is the favorite. Um, <laughs> both of you, both of you. <laughs> So, so, you know, I think that, uh, you know, so when I was on tour for the Vagina Bible, so I wrote the Vagina Bible because I was like, every single day in the office, I was answering the same questions. And I was like, how in this age of information are we here? And I thought women need a textbook. And on tour for the Vagina Bible, every place, like back in the old days when we did the tour, um, people, every place, there was questions about menopause every place. And it seemed like creating a space to talk about taboos like the vulva and vagina created a space to talk about, I guess, what's the final taboo in aging woman's body. And so I thought, well, I, I guess this is the next book. I signed a 
two book deal. So there had to be another book. So I thought, I guess this is it. This is what, you know, I've, I've been through menopause and I, I, you know, take care of a lot of people who, who are, you know, having complications of menopause. So I, I thought, well, I guess this is it. And so that's, that's how I, how I came across deciding to, to make this the second book. So yeah, you've got, you have a new book coming out though. Oh, and I do. Yeah. So, so tell me, tell me how you decided to to write about penises. I mean, obviously the whole world is a penis, but but why you? And then tell me about the. I want to hear about the next book because I love the title. Yeah. All, the, all the K's. There's so many K's in the title. K is supposed to be a comedic um, consonant, right? So I don't know if it's supposed to be funny with that title or not, but it, it resonates, I suppose. Um, I wrote the the book about penis. I was in the process of actually drafting a proposal for the book about the brain because my interest was to look at all of these promises that are made about the brain and to poke at the evidence of those promises and see how well it stands up when you kind of punch it a little bit. Um, but in the process of that, I was driving around and I have three sons and I was in my car with them like I so often am. And it occurred to me for for some reason that I actually have a lot of expertise in penises, not necessarily because of the sons, but because I have a PhD in reproductive biology and I looked at the, you know, sex determination, sex development. My postdoc at the University of California, San Francisco was in penile development. And I thought, my gosh, I know so much about these things, you know, I should go. And then, you know what, it turns out nobody had written a book just about penises, the animal kingdom, which, you know, I mean, why not? They're so interesting. And then it seemed like a good time to kind of get into the discussion for myths like, oh, they're plungers and things like that. They have these special accoutrements or accoutrements because, you know, they've got just this tiny little edge to them and things like that. And so the reason the subtitle of that book is Life Lessons from the Animal Penis is because among the lessons is the one that ours has actually not got a lot of bells and whistles. It's not not a standout when it comes to decorations. Um, and the other lesson from that, though, is that means we get to do a lot more fun things with it and enjoy a lot more intimacy with it than, you know, the ones that do have, you know, hooks and scrapers and maces and spikes and all these other things on them, like, or the, you know, hypodermics, <laughs> things like that. So that was fun to do. And you think about then all the poor vaginas, right? And you think about like all the way yeah. the vaginas. So what's the craziest sort of like penis vagina combo? Well, it would be the penis not vagina combo combination of the bed bug because they don't really bother with the like trying, you know, getting it into a bespoke receptacle. And instead they just jab like somewhere around the thorax. And the interesting thing is, is that in some species that do that, the thorax has kind of started like there's been some selection pressure for to guide it kind of into possibly like a less harmful part of the thorax. And so it's kind of started to develop a little vagina like thing <laughs> in the thorax of these animals so that it kind of the hypodermic needle like penis gets guided into that instead of, I guess, hitting something a little more vital. So that would be the one for sure. That's really fascinating considering, I guess, well, you can't really kill bed bugs. Like they're very <laughs> difficult to kill. So I guess yeah. if any animal can stand a spike to the chest for reproduction, I guess it's a bed bug. Yeah, the female does suffer. Um, there are other organisms where they just job about and kind of pull into the head. I mean, it just really, it, pretty much anything you think of, it's out there. That's so. just, yeah, I know. And then of course there's the famous duck the, the, the ballistic corkscrew duck penis. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, one of my favorite combinations is it's one of the few primates that does have a penis that has kind of interesting decor to it. And it's a kind of macaque. It's called the stump tail macaque. And the penis is actually shaped like a garden spade, like a long skinny one. And you look at it, you're like, that looks like a garden spade. <laughs> and so biologically, if a structure has that kind of shape to it, then you kind of go looking for the recipient structure, right? to see if it's got some kind of shape that might look like an adaptation to that. And very rarely do they actually look at that side of things, but they did with this macaque. And if the vagina of this macaque species has a stalactite hanging from the ceiling, basically, <laughs> and the spade is going to like slide underneath that thing to kind of get to a point where it can deposit the sperm. Uh, kind of like sneaking underneath. Like yeah, just like, whoop. yeah, just like that. Oh, yeah. see, I was very unimaginably thinking of like a wheelbarrow. 
No, I haven't seen, you know, you did, you did have to come up with the one thing I don't think I have seen, which is wheelbarrow genitalia. So wheelbarrow you know. vagina. We haven't found that in the animal kingdom yet. I know. Right. Uh, well, cause we haven't looked probably. I know. Right. Yeah. Cause you know, that's a problem. Well, you found that looking at the menopause um, information, right? I mean, how often do you find that they just, well, they just didn't even look right. Like, yeah, well, you know, when you're sort of an inferior toxic being, um, you know, and leaking. Yeah, you're leaking. <laughs> we already know. Look, I mean, it's it's fascinating. So one thing that's really fascinating to me about how the ancients, for lack of a better word, and that really applies up until unfortunately pretty recently, how mm -hmm. they they so they explained, you know, if you're, you know, everything to do with you as a as a woman before menopause was related to blood and menstruation and that you were too tight, you were too bloody, too, you know, too fluid filled. And those words didn't mean exactly necessarily what we use them for today. Um, and you got to get the blood out, meaning, you know, you, you got to be 14 and married off and have sex because that's the cure for everything, right? Open you up. Um, I mean, that's why, you know, they bled people, right? You know, that's, mm -hmm. also, you know, that, that's also part of it uh, because women were too moist. So they got blood a lot for, um, for medical conditions. So leeches to the vulva, I believe is yeah, something you mentioned. Was, was done in menopause. That's awesome. Don't tell Gwyneth Paltrow though. She's going to start selling organic leeches. I bet <laughs> I gave her an idea. I'm going to charge that. Um, so, so anyway, so, so you think, okay, so all of this blood, that's the root of all of your problem. When it stops, then you think that, okay, well then you like would ascend to a better level of being, but of course not because, you know, because one, it's the ultimate gaslighting, but two, it's, well, now, since they didn't really know it was drying up in the way that we know, um, so they just thought all the toxins were accumulating. And so <laughs> it's even worse. So you mm -hmm. like, it's like really being a woman is like you went from bad to worse. And so if you're a 60 year old man and you're shoveling in the garden and you hurt your arm, well, it's because you were shoveling in the garden. And if you're a 60 year old woman and you're lifting laundry and hurt your shoulder, it's because of your uterus. It's because of course. Those damn things are to blame for everything. I know. Yeah. So, that's, so that's pretty, you know, when you think about, you know, hysteria in the 16, 1700s and how, you know, it's just, they looked for explanations for men, even though they wouldn't be what we would think of today, but they looked for explanations that sort of fit their physiology. But because female physiology was problematic, and by definition, then females were problematic, the, way, the answers they came up with were just like so much worse, you know? Um, so it's actually really fascinating. So, you know, my podcast, um, Body Stuff, which had... Mm -hmm. um, right. The episode this week is actually about anxiety and I interviewed Helen King. Um, and so she had some real fascinating, um, you know, uh, insights into the ancients and on um, this whole concept of, um, you know, mental illness and being tied to the uterus and all this stuff. So I hope people take a listen to that. Um, Sorry, I'm just imagining being tied to a uterus and like, <laughs> I mean, I guess I was that at some point when there was an umbilical cord in a sense, but <laughs> free from that for a while. You know, they thought the uterus, you know, wandered the body. And so, oh, that's right. you know, yeah. if you're of breath is because your, your uterus, so they referred to the uterus as an animal within an animal. Oh boy. So speaking of language, I mean, you, <laughs> you ran into, like, so, so we talked about the bloom and can you just talk a little bit about where menopause came from? Just like how, what it originally meant? Because I think that's really interesting that it didn't, like how it transmogrified. Yeah. So before the 1800s, um, they called it the cessation, you know, for a cessation of periods. Um, they called it the climacteric, which is probably the best term. So mm -hmm. because that kind of represents phases of life. And men had climacteric too. So it wasn't sort of just gendered. And also, you know, in Eastern medicine, they have phases of life. They're different as well. But so climacteric really sort of is, I think, a much more sort of world encompassing term. And then uh, they also called it the change. But that's kind of more of a, a more recent one. All these C's again. Maybe it's that K thing. I don't know. The, K, the hard sound for the cut of climacteric. climacteric. No. So, so there was this guy called um, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, um, de la Jardin. 
and uh, mm -hmm. he was in, uh, you know, in France. And in 1812, he wrote a dissertation um, where he came up with a new term for the cessation. Because I guess if you're trying to make a name for yourself and you're trying to open a business, maybe it's a good way to like brand. It's like branding, right? Right. So, yeah. So he came up with, I mean, not that the cessation was working, it was working just fine, but um, so he came up with menes. So that's Greek for months or the monthlies, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then pausi, which is Greek for cessation, menstrual cessation. So, so in French, that sounded like, so it's together, the, the Greek words menace pausi are menace pausi. And so it was la menace pausi originally. And then along the way, you know, a few years later, he dropped the accent and dropped one of the S's and it became la menopause. And so that's how it came about. And obviously it's a little bit problematic because one, people think the men is men, but it's not. <laughs> and two, it's, we now, we use the word pause as a pause, not as a stop. But I think the, the biggest reason for me why it's problematic, not only because Desjardins contributed nothing to the field, his book, <laughs> I read it, I have it, um, this, is a, this is a reprint of it. Um, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, de la menopause ou la critique, de, oh, they called it the critical age, la critique, that was it. So I did read it um, and uh, you know, with my sort of, you know, Canadian school French, um, but also I had a friend uh, translate big portions of it, mm -hmm. French speaking. And um, he, like his advice was like, don't wear blush because that's really bad. <laughs> and, and keep your face, girls, because you don't want to show your breasts. Um, and and like, the, like he contributed nothing. So we're using this word from a man who contributed nothing. And it taught, we now know that the last period really actually is of not that much importance for the day-to-day -day management of menopause. And so, and it's kind of weird to be like, you know, when you're 60 talking about being in menopause and like you've been out of period for 10 years, like, like, can't we move like beyond my actual uterus? Because Matt, we know now menopause is as much a brain event as it is an ovarian. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. Um, speaking of which, I think, you know, you, you do address some of the brain experience of menopause, right? The brain fog. And um, I kind of interested in what I, I mean, I read what you wrote, but I'd like to hear what hear you talk about that a little bit. And I think we should talk about physical activity then. Sure. So brain fog. Yeah. So that's, um, you know, as as you have. So this fascinating study that came out last week from Dr. Lisa Moscone. And I had the pleasure of interviewing her and it's on my Instagram TV for anyone who's interested. And she's a neuroscience researcher and she studies um, the aging brain and basically mm -hmm. We know that about 60, 65%, two thirds, approximately women report a brain fog during the menopause transition, meaning they might like lose their keys or they figure where they are and they just feel maybe a little bit overwhelmed. And it's actually been well studied. So this is one of these areas where researchers have actually taken what women said and listened to them. So I think that's one, it's an important thing. And what we find is that actually when women are having brain fog, they still outperform men on memory testing. So, <laughs> their drops, but they still right. okay, mm -hmm. and that it recovers. So it's not permanent. So that's the other thing. It, the researchers have sort of summed it up as a slowdown in the ability to take in new information. And it makes a lot of sense because your brain is shifting basically operating platforms. You had all these connections in your brain mm -hmm. for reproduction that you don't need anymore. And so Lisa Moscone's brain imaging study shows that during the menopause transition, several areas of the brain shrink and have dramatic reduction in glucose, you know, so sugar. So the brain's not getting fed as much. And people are like, oh, well, that's a sign of menopause being harmful, but it rebounds, other areas expand to accommodate. And if you think about the grandmother hypothesis and how we evolved that menopause has a reason, we couldn't be we couldn't have evolved this way if menopause made everybody incompetent. Like it just couldn't be, right? So what she says is you have to think about it in the way that your brain is pruning pathways that are no longer needed. And so of course areas are going to shrink because they're not needed anymore. No. You don't need to get pregnant. You don't need to control your cycle. 
And it makes sense, like, you know, anytime your phone has up, put, updated a new operating system, it's freaking glitchy for the, the next little while, right? And you're like, oh, I got to update all those apps and everything's running slower. And how do I figure it out? And like, there's dang passwords again, right? Exactly. Like word finding. <laughs> that's a little bit like um like menopause and so that's yeah. what I want people to think about is it's really kind of like that um and so you know i and i thought that was like super fascinating it's so, interesting yeah so what well, was there any like sort of new revolutionary research that you kind of came across with the people <laughs> you were like whoa like this is really <laughs> everything we thought on you know on it you know, I, it's interesting because I know in your book, you mentioned that, you know, you acknowledge the fact that there are um, trans women and that the research on trans women and trans men is, is like kind of very scanty, right? And so you, it's difficult to address that. And one of the things I'm doing in my book was I was looking at the animal kingdom. I knew a lot of this already, but there are just, you know, so many, we, so many examples in the animal kingdom of how sex is not a binary anatomy is not a binary you know continua of things there are you know animals that make eggs that do the inserting and drawing up of the sperm and you know it's just all of their animals that do both they can do it within themselves they can do it within a chain of animals you know one of the lessons from the book was that you know we like to do binaries, right? We like to go, this is a bucket here, <laughs> this is a bucket here, and now my brain is full, and so I just, everything's gotta go in these two buckets, right? We really like to categorize things, but when you look at you know, what's out there, you know, people like to appeal to biological essentialism and say, well, nature makes two sexes, that's not true. And not only that, but it does, nature completely disconnects the anatomy with which we think we're familiar from this idea of a binary and um so it was really interesting to discover the extent of that when i was writing this book and how evolution just kind of damn, evolution doesn't give a rip <laughs> actually like honestly like who's making which kind of gamete um it's more just about bringing the gametes together and it will use every tool in the toolkit to do that and use it on you know whichever mating partner or partners there are involved in that process and so i thought that that was really an interesting discovery from the book um I and i write i write a lot about evolution in that and you just mentioned the grandmother hypothesis and it's interesting to me that you're writing about menopause and i'm writing about penises in the animal kingdom but evolution is right there right, right. and something to bring up so can you talk a little bit more about the grandmother hypothesis yeah i mean and i love what you say like like evolution doesn't care how do i get the next generation that's what evolution cares about the net like yeah. right like it's just what's good enough to get the job done you know it's like okay this is the team that showed up this is what we're working with you know right. and so gene variant in the next next generation and that's it right yeah. that's where you go with it it's so important for us to sort of you know to take nature off its pedestal because you know it's it's really it's just really how do we keep it going that's really it we just just just, just keep it going and so, <laughs> you know the, we always get sort of hung up i think when we talk about evolution or a lot of people do with just sort of like the next generation right like mm -hmm. is what does the next generation look like what does the next generation look like and i think for a lot of animal species although i'm not an animal expert um that seems to be the case but with humans um, so, you know, this is a really, I think, great example of how, you know, the patriarchal thinking, which clearly animals don't have, um, is, has kind of like messed up how we look at our bodies. And so, you know, we've always looked at menopause as a sign of failure, ovarian failure. You know, why mm -hmm. are we failing? And of course, you know, no one ever says, well, why are penises failing? Like, why don't we call it a rectopause, right? Like, it, mm -hmm. it's always referenced to women that way. And so the question is, obviously the answer is not to compare ovaries to testicles because they're different organs, just like the heart and the liver are different organs, they do different things. Mm -hmm. So the, thing, the answer is to compare ovaries to other ovaries. And so if you compare us to chimps, which are our closest ancestor, we have very similar ovaries. They work in very similar ways. They ovulate the same way, they menstruate. And chimp, both chimps and humans, reproduction winds down in the late forties. The difference is chimps die and humans keep mm -hmm. living. So the, answer, the question we need to be asking is why do women keep living, not why do ovaries fail? 
And when you look at it that way, it opens up the door to a lot of different hypotheses. Which yeah, is for sure. Hypothesis. And mm -hmm. which is for those I'm listening who don't know, is the idea that having an extra pair of hands helps human reproduction, basically. And if you think about it, if you were, think about our ancestral grandmothers, tens of thousands of years ago, however long ago, you know, you've delivered a baby. How are you getting your food source? You know, maybe your partner was killed or maybe he's out hunting or whatever. And there's shelter and you've got one small baby and now you've delivered another. Who's going to get you the food? Your grandmother is going to get you the food or your children's grandmother. She's only going to get you the food if she's invested in it. So actually there's some theories that all the cute little expressions babies make aren't <laughs> mother you're wired to you're wired to protect your offspring it's to draw the grandmother in to get the grandmother <laughs> invested in helping and so you know and so yeah so you know at, at some point ancestrally someone would have lived a little bit beyond their reproduction and they would have been useful and so their children would have had more children and so on and so on until eventually we have you know long-lived grandmothers um, and long-lived humans in general um, I always like to point out when people say, you know, women, you know, oh, why do ovaries fail? It's like, well, women actually live longer than men, you know? So that's an important thing to also kind of point out. So, um, and also in my podcast, I got to interview Dr. Kristen Hawks, who is sort of the architect of the grandmother hypothesis. So that's mm -hmm. a really cool episode to kind of listen to. Uh, but yeah, so it's amazing, you know, the lessons that we can learn from the animal kingdom. Uh, and I mean, not to sort of project too much, but, you know, killer whales, um, the men all the male killer whales all die around the age of 50. It's the grandmothers, right. you know. So obviously they just don't contribute to the next generation. That's why they likely die off. Uh, but you don't hear about that, right? So why don't you think we we hear these? I mean, I you know the answer, why we don't talk about these <laughs> things in school and why we all talk about kind of the mighty penis instead. Yeah, the, the, one of the surprises I learned in in the writing the penis book is that I mean I kind of knew this because it's my research area, but I was surprised at the extent of this as well, which is that when I went to look at what they had discovered about vaginas, because the idea is like the macaque, if you've got a penis that has kind of certain features and you kind of expect some sort of sort of corollary features in the vagina because it's kind of give and take of an evolutionary exchange going on there. They hadn't really looked so much at vaginas, like at all. And even as recently as just a few years ago, they'd done a study where people who do genitalia research focus by and large on the side of things where the sperm are made and much, 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 much less on the side of things where the eggs are made. Um, to the point that within my lifetime, certainly, I mean, probably within this century, they were still writing, oh, it's probably not worth looking at that. So there's probably not anything going on because the perception was is that it's just passive, that, you know, a vagina is a passive hole <laughs> that you just put some sperm in, you know, and you're all done. And it, it's, it's so biologically nonsensical because if the idea is that there's some kind of, you know, call and response going on there, well, if there's a call, you should be looking for what that response was, right? But they were like, oh, that's nothing. So it was interesting to me to see how readily that was dismissed very much like your findings of so much about, you know, what happens to the ovaries and these assumptions that they were making without bothering to actually look at what was going on, right, during menopause and after. Um, because, I mean, who gave a rip, right? Who was doing the research? Right. That's what it comes down to. Who's asking the questions? Who's answering them? Who's deciding what those answers mean? Well, you know, you think about it, like if, you know, how much this sort of idea that you know women are just receptacles like mm -hmm. into every you know into the animal kingdom right you know yeah, leaky receptacles yeah and how you know this idea that you know i'm sure it was harder to get funding i mean i i'm guessing but i bet getting funding to study um female aspects of reproduction in you know in insects and in males and whatever is probably less you know was probably less um successful than funding to study males and um, you know, it's, it's interesting. And again, I think it gets back to what I was saying. It depends on the question you ask. And I think that's something that people forget about science, that it all starts with the right, like if you start with the wrong hypothesis, you, and you're dedicated to that hypothesis, you don't sort of notice all the alarm bells as you're going along, right? Um, or you're not curious enough to understand the complementary hypothesis, you end up with mace penises and needle penises and like, oh, well, it just goes in there. 
<laughs> right, because you're you're making assumptions based on the biases you bring to the work. There's no no such thing as sort of objective scientific question, right? Or research pursuit. There, you always got a bag of biases that you bring to it, and that really stood out for me. But I also think too, it's this absence of logic. Like, crazy. like if, yeah. if there's all these yes. penal shenanigans, really? Like, like you don't think that if the penis is doing this, well, then the, there, there must there must be something. Yeah. There must be yeah. something going on on the other side. Nope, nope, nothing. Just a hole, just a bag, just drop this. Yep. I mean, it really was. It was just a complete dismissal of what otherwise would be held to be a pretty basic principle. Yeah. But I guess, you know, because people think that women are simple, stupid creatures, right? We leak, though. We're very leaky. So, yeah. There is um, that. So we I'm need plunging. <laughs> right. so, so you, so you want to hear a, a fun story about the origin of vaginal steaming, at least in Western medicine? I'm not sure. <laughs> yes, of course. I want to hear your vaginal steaming origin story. <laughs> You know, this is obviously, you know, Gwyneth Paltrow tried to make this popular and, and make it like it's some kind of thing. And you see all these like yoni steams and stuff on Instagram. And so, you know, what it, yes, they, they did used to actually fumigate. They thought they were fumigating the uterus. They probably weren't because they had really like no idea what they were doing. Yeah. But, you know, you have to remember that they did think the menstrual cycle was super important. They didn't know why, but they knew it was important. And so that's why like 80% of the Hippocratic recipes are all stuff to go in the vagina. Basically it's all there. Right. Um, not, none of it helpful that you should ever use. But so, so a lot of the recipes involved things that were desiccated because we were too wet, right? So all these astringents mm -hmm. and these other things. But you would also pick the type of steam that you squatted over um, to sort of, you know, uh, to dry out your insides, not that it would really do that. But um, my favorite recipe that I came across is, you know, you have all these herbs, but, you know, if you're, you, you disembowel a puppy and stuff it with the herbs and then burn it. And that's how you get the fumes to fumigate your uterus in the time of Hippocrates. Yeah, I wish you'd had a content warning on disembowel a puppy just then. <laughs> that was really surprising. Yeah. Yeah, I know, right? I read, I had to read it like three times. Um, but it gives you an idea about how people just cherry pick what they want. Um, and people pay a bad game of telephone and all of a sudden it's become like yoni steaming. And it's like, no, really, it's, you know, people have been stuffing steam up orifices for centuries and not knowing what it did. Oh, I have a, I have a stuffing things in orifices story that I discovered while I was doing this. So there was a, a guy who staked his claim. He's like a very early member of the Royal Society in Britain. And he um, had heard a story that there was this woman somewhere else in Britain who had given birth to 18 rabbits. <laughs> <Sorry>. oh. <laughs> you might have heard of this one. And he um, claimed that he'd gone and witnessed her actually because they thought you know at the, they do, among many misconceptions about the things that go on with uteri and so forth that you know, like if you saw a kind of animal you might give birth to that kind of animal or, or your fetus could take the shape of that animal anyway he went and quote unquote witnessed this woman birthing 18 rabbits but what of course it turned out and she actually did she eventually sort of admitted to this and this guy could never eat rabbit again actually after he found out he'd been duped but she'd actually just put like rat skinned rabbits up her you know self into her vagina and then just kind of quote unquote birth them out for the purposes of convincing this man that she was giving birth to rabbits so i, um, I hope there was some money in it for her it i hope there was some kind of antibiotic of na you know, natural antibiotic available for her because yikes you know no i know it's a bit yeah, I mean, some of the, you know, I always I often think, you know, when they're writing modern horror stories, they just really need to read more like, you know, medieval and sort of old English stuff. And we I mean, really not just old English, you could probably go to any culture, really. I mean, yeah. they kind of thought was like normal in the 14, 1500s and just, you know, run with that because a lot of it's pretty like, wow. Um, I guess the most interesting thing I found when I was writing the Vagina Bible along that line was, um, was the origin of Merkins, pubic hair wigs. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so they so they came about because people would remove their pubic hair because of lice. Um, you know that was the the best way to get rid of it. And um, but the problem is is then you can now see your one people if you remove your pubic hair then people would know you had lice and a, and that was associated with a lower socioeconomic class. 
Mm. And two, then unfortunately now people could see your syphilitic ulcers. And so um, so you could hide those with, with the Merkin, the pubic hair wig. Um, and so, Do we know? Yeah, and I'm like, I'm like, man, people are so crafty. Like, like, like right. imagine being the Merkin maker. Is that on Etsy? You were mentioning I think that's a Netflix. small but mighty. <laughs> series the merkin maker or maybe that's the gonna merkin be, maker okay, i'm gonna write i'm gonna talk about the merkin maker and the people who have to come and visit the merkin maker and the reasons that they have to do it and what the merkins are made out of and how do you affix them and, and like when do you make the big reveal that it's a merkin i know there's a lot going on there i know right it's sort of like yeah. when you're like is it before you like when you're when you're out for like your your you know your your dinner of you know goat on a on a stick i guess um watching the Spanish Inquisition, you know, from afar. <laughs> and does a Merkin itch? It seems like that would be super itchy, especially, okay, I got it. I got to stop thinking about Merkins. I'm going to ask you something different <laughs> now because now I'm like running away with like Merkin questions. Um, I, I want to- We all have Merkin questions. I, I mean, you know, who, who does not wake up every day and think, gosh, another Merkin question, you know, I should write them all down. So I have a actual question question for you. And I think it's probably fairly evident, but why is your this your latest book called A Manifesto? Uh, well, you know, I think it gets down to so I, I did that wasn't the original title. I mean, I was sort of like, oh, the menopause Bible. Oh, that'll be a great book end, you know, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. That's a fine title. And then as I was writing it, and I really I started with the history section. Um, cause you know, I sort of knew the medicine and I wanted to, and I just yeah. got really angry. I got really angry about, you know, the lot, there's that lie that's perpetuated that, oh, women weren't meant to have menopause because, you know, they all died. It's like, no, they didn't all die. If they all died, how did they have three or four children? How did they, women all had six or seven kids because so many died in childbirth. How are they all dying in childbirth and yet also all having six children? How does that work? It doesn't <laughs> work. And then you think about the fact that that erases every woman who lived beyond the age of 50. And the information was there, but it just, you know, at every step of the way, it felt like the story of menopause has tried to be erased and to be turned into something awful. And consequently, women fear it. And I mean, nobody wants to have bad symptoms. And, and but this idea that it's the worst thing in the world that could happen to you is really quite common. And I just I just wanted to sort of, I sort of imagined myself standing like on Poet's Corner, like with my megaphone, like <laughs> this is what menopause is. If you have symptoms, it's treatable. It's not the end of the world. In fact, you should draw strength from knowing that our ancestral grandmothers got us here. They literally birthed society. Like we wouldn't be here. You know, I mean, we, this gets back to evolution, right? Like we have the kludgiest freaking biology. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so our babies have these ginormous heads mm -hmm. and we have these tiny pelvises so we can walk upright. Fitting a big head through a small pelvis is not an easy thing. No, it's not. Evolution makes it work by the person who has the baby suffers. That's how it works. You suffer the, the physical carnage. So whether it's heavy periods or a laceration or blood loss, and so the grandmother, you know, was needed to sort of kind of help along with that. And so that it sort of erases everything. And so I just wanted, you know, people to sort of understand that that the story of menopause has been written by the patriarchy, and and we need to reclaim that. Um, and so yeah, that's how the manifesto came about. Um, that's so interesting. Because go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, because even though my book is about penises, this is not actually in conflict because it also is a story about the patriarchy and the damage it does. But I think more the damage it does to men, actually, with the demands it places on them for impossible masculinity. It's called fallacy and spelled with a PH because the fallacy is that, you know, your penis is you and you are your penis. And that's what makes a man a man. And if you have one, you are one. And if you don't have one, you aren't. And we all know that we're not actually binary. We don't fit into buckets that way. We have an amazing brain with the most unconstrained behavioral expression of any species on earth, right? <laughs> I mean, it's really amazing. I mean, we put you know a helicopter 
on Mars and we can do so many things with our little dexterous hands and our amazing brains. And I don't know why we need to constrain ourselves, you know, with biological essentialism for other species. And the one thing though, that I wanted to get across in that book and what the real fallacy is, is that this association that there's this like intellectual association between, you know, having a penis and being male or having a penis and making sperm and that kind of thing. And also that, this association that they impose upon boys and men that your penis has to be this like throbbing member, you know, and the size makes the man and all this other stuff. And, you know, I do spend the last couple of chapters of the book, just like contextualizing that around what's actually happening in nature, you know, um, how, what, how we size up <laughs> compared to other animals. We're in a 22 way tie with other primates, you know, it's really not super impressive. Um, and what really matters. And the fact that, you know, the contours of, the human penis imply based on the patterns that you see out there that it's meant to be a tool that is used in a context of intimacy like you check boxes before you engage wow. and the penis is like the bed bug or the duck you know with the corks and that kind of thing with those that's that's um a very often what we call forced copulation that doesn't require intimacy so the less adorned the more the intimacy and i think that's a beautiful message and it means also of course that we can use it in all kinds of ways that you know ducks can't <laughs> for example which makes it a lot more fun anyway <laughs> no i think i think it's such a great message i absolutely agree i think i think toxic masculinity is the worst thing for everybody and it's so harmful and yes. um and i also you know sort of just honing on that kind of big brain thing um you know a lot of times when i talk about the grandmother hypothesis i hear well what if i'm not a grandmother i'm like that's okay our ancestors did it so now we have these big brains and these long lives. So now you're free to do with whatever you want. You know, these big brains gave us the computers we're on. And like you said, put a helicopter on Mars. Like these <laughs> brains, we, so these brains mean we don't have to be constrained by our biology anymore. You know, yeah. that's one of the gifts of ancestral grandmothers. It's one, yeah. It's definitely a gift of the the human brain and the social one, which is yeah. what I talk about in my next book. Because the thing is, is you know, with this book, the whole thing about that book was going to be, oh, I'm going to look at all these interventions that people promise, like supplements and transcranial this and that and all this other stuff. And I have to say that what I came down to, and you mentioned it quite a bit, is really just the old standards, right? Just like physical exercise and things like that. But the thing is, is that one of the important things about physical exercise a lot of the time is when you do it with somebody else and you offload like a cognitive burden and you share things with them. And that's, I, that's kind of an interaction with the benefits of physical exercise. I know you wrote about possibly going cycling with your partner someday, right? And that's, you know, you'll be getting both of those things when you do it. Yeah, we did. Um, we did a six mile hike um, in the Run Headlands yesterday. And uh, yeah, we um, will probably go biking next weekend. And we're I think we're gonna hike to Muir Beach next weekend. And yeah, nice. yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm privileged enough that I have a trainer. I mean, we work remotely. So that makes it much less expensive. But yeah, I mean, I do weights um, three times a week. And because that's super, you know, we, we sort of we say, Oh, women, you're gonna like all big if you work out. Well, first of all, <laughs> Like, that's cool if you want to get big. That's awesome. Um, but again, it gets back to these sort of gendered expectations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the most important things we can do as we age is actually not just weight-bearing exercise, but actually working with weights and resistance training because we mm -hmm. lose muscle mass as we age. And so, yeah, so I'm like, I'm like working out, um, trying to, you know, kind of get big like Arnold. Well, not really that big. <laughs> Um, and you know, I tell, I, I, like, I tell my, my patients that if exercise were a pill, we'd be prescribing it to everybody. Yeah. Um, and so, yes, but I'm super excited for your new book. Oh my God. So have you encountered, have you ever been attacked by like the keto crazies? Because, like they are, I, there's like, seriously, I've blocked the only, besides like four spurters, I've actually blocked quite a few doctors who are like super into keto, like, and I, oh my God, I should talk, did I tell you about my date with a keto person? I, went on I don't know. Oh my I God. don't know. I was on a date with someone I didn't know that they were really into keto and mm -hmm. really, like really, like as in really. And it's a second date and he starts telling me how, you know, sugar causes all, like cancer didn't exist before sugar. And, um, and keto, if you're, if you're keto, you <laughs> prevent Alzheimer's and cancer. And I'm like, I'm like, 
did you even look me up? Do you know like, who I am? They're saying that. And I'm, like, <laughs> I'm like looking for the eject button. I'm like, oh, look, my lift is here. I guess I called it early. I have to go now. Go. <laughs> go. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I think the thing is to be wary of like true believers and 100% effect on, of anything for, you know, 100% of people. I mean, that's how human physiology works, period, paragraph. It just doesn't work that way. Yeah. Just, so I'm just warning you to be prepared if you're if you're looking at keto um, scientifically that um, I, I was really surprised. It's and it's you know what was really fascinating and this is something that you very equipped to deal with. There's such an overlap with sort of like bro, I guess what I call like bro culture and masculinity and because it's all this like mm -hmm. it's a carnivore diet, you know. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I do have some experience with, you know, a certain demographic, let's yeah. say. I'm just reading yeah. did, did, did we get any, did we get, oh, I'm, and I'm super excited. So, oh, you have to tell everybody, when is that, is the books available for pre-order now, right? Oh, it is available for pre-order. It's called The Tailored Brain. That's the short title. I'm not going to get into the rest of it. And um, it comes out officially on December 14th. Thank you for bringing that up. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> and so I would love, um, if you want to blur, please um, send it to me. I will shoot you an email. Thank you. <laughs> I I think, I, yeah, I, I hope you like it when you do. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't like we have questions. Do we have questions? That look like it. Well, that's okay. We answered them all. We were just. I think, just I think you guys did. I think you answered everything during this wonderful. And like I said, entertaining and enlightening discussion. Thank you so much for doing both. Um, and we so appreciate you both being here. Uh, I just want to thank everybody on behalf of Book Passage, um, our authors and our viewers. Um, this will be available if you want to share it with people um, on uh, Zoom. And um, we definitely encourage you to purchase the books. We have both of them available in our bookstore. You can call us or go on our website. And um, thanks again for this great discussion. Everybody um, stay safe and have a wonderful 4th of July. Thank you. Happy 4th, everybody. And thanks, Emily. And thank you, Book Passage. Thank, thank you. you.